Um, it's a pleasure to have Jared Kaplan here from Johns Hopkins and OpenAI. Uh, Jared is um, another theoretical physicist, uh, uh, started, has maintains a research program in uh, particle physics and quantum field theory, uh, but increasingly over the last uh, several years has been interested in problems in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And in particular, um, has been working on the things that you'll be talking about, which are scaling behaviors in, in networks and their learning properties uh, of special relevance to the networks that we all read about in the newspapers these days that are revolutionizing uh, how we interact with, with computers in natural language. So this um, a very timely and um, what should be promises to be a very fun talk. So Jared, please. Great, thanks so much for uh, for the invitation to be here. I've really enjoyed uh, Jenny and Surya's uh, uh, talks and uh, uh, hope you'll enjoy mine as well. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm imagining that, that the audience is fairly diverse. There may be people who know a lot about machine learning, um, but maybe a lot of you are just physicists who don't know so much or uh, uh, but are just interested or, or people with other backgrounds like biology or neuroscience. So um, I'll give you kind of uh, a quick overview of what is machine learning sort of, uh, at least in the way that I think about it. And the main point there, uh, and I think throughout the talk will be that it's, it's really quite simple. Um, and, uh, and then I'll talk about language modeling specifically and very, very briefly, I'll talk about uh, transformers, which are the kind of neural networks we use for language modeling. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, the motivation for and, and some work on scaling laws for uh, language modeling. And in particular, scaling laws may be much more generally in, uh, in a lot of contexts in machine learning. So um, I'll, I'll focus a lot in this talk on language modeling, but I'll actually show you that a lot of pretty much everything that I say applies to modeling a lot of other data distributions, um, images, uh, videos, uh, even maybe trying to solve math problems in certain ways. Um, so, uh, so I'll, I'll try to argue that that these simple scaling laws that I'll be discussing are actually uh, uh, quite universal. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, uh, what Bill mentioned: this sort of recent success of uh, uh, that's gotten a lot of attention, the the, the GPT three language model, um, and specifically a kind of emergent property of this model. Uh, you might say, which is that it's it's able to learn in context in kind of the way that a human would uh, see many examples of something um, and then intuit what has to come next and what to do. Um, th this model seems to uh, pretty strongly exhibit these, these kinds of behaviors. Um, and if there's time, maybe I'll talk about uh, uh, some, some work I did with a student at Hopkins on uh, sort of theories behind uh, why these scaling laws uh, uh, are there. Um, so please feel free to interrupt or just enter in the chat. I can see the chat. Um, we have this uh, very luxurious 90 minutes. Um, so uh, please interrupt me if there's any, any confusion. Um, so what is contemporary machine learning? Um, I think really it just boils down to something very simple. It's just curve fitting with a very, very general kind of function approximation. So curve fitting or, or regression. Um, uh, if you're a scientist of any kind, you've certainly encountered some situation where you had a bunch of data, uh, like, like what's seen here, and you want to sort of model that data in some way, you want to draw a line through it. And uh, machine learning is really basically just doing this at a very, very large scale. Um, the uh, progress in AI, I think, recently um, is a bit different from, from AI from, say, 40 or 50 years ago, 30 years ago, um, in the sense that uh, because it's based on this sort of learning or func function approximation, ultimately these models are learning correlations, statistical correlations, rather than say logic. Um, they're not learning uh, hard-coded logical rules. Um, and there's a sense, if you're a physicist and you like this analogy, um, that, that this is a bit like studying a condensed matter physics system, where it's sort of nearly hopeless to understand all of the individual constituents of exactly what's going on, but we can get certain, I think, powerful kind of overall statistical understandings of, of, of what's happening. Um, and so uh, uh, if, this, if this subject is really new to you, then, uh, uh, then I'm, going to, I'm going to sort of explain things from basics in the, in the next few slides. And the, the basic point is just that if you 
want to take the approach of just doing curve fitting in a very powerful way, then you need some very general and versatile class of, uh, of, of functions that you can then fit to your data um, to quote unquote learn uh, about that data and, and its properties. And all a neural network is in machine learning is a way of building up very complicated general functions from high dimensional matrix multiplication um, so we have big matrices and a very, very, very simple nonlinearity so that if you multiply two or three or four or 10 or 100 matrices together, you just get another matrix multiplication. But if you insert a nonlinear function in between, then you can uh, greatly increase the class of functions that you can model. And that's really all there is to it. So um, in machine learning and with neural networks, we imagine that we start with data in the form of some vector, usually in a very high dimensional space, hundreds, thousands, maybe even more dimensions. Um, and to process this data, we apply an affine transformation to it with some matrix W called a weight. And uh, you, add a uh, you add a vector B called a bias to it. So this is just an affine transformation. And then all you do to make this nonlinear in, in most cases uh, that, are, that are currently used is you apply a nonlinearity to every element of the resulting vector. And uh, what that means, the, 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 maybe the simplest nonlinear function I can think of is what's actually used, which is a function which is linear if the argument is positive and it's zero if the argument is negative. This, is, this has the silly uh, name ReLU in uh, machine learning, but that's, that's all this function is. And that's, that's the nonlinearity that's, uh, that's most frequently used. And, uh, and so you can just build up a neural network by composing many of these operations. And just to make sure uh, no one is lost, you might have neural network parameters like this matrix W and this uh, bias vector B. You have some single item of data like this X uh, that's shown. And so one layer of a simple uh, neural network would just apply W times X plus B, it would get this output. And you just drop the, you set to zero the negative uh, elements. And a full neural network is just a composition of many of these layers. Um, with different parameters typically for, for each layer. Um, and so uh, uh, there's this picture that I know when I, before I had ever worked on this subject or really thought about it very much, seemed like it must encode something very, very complicated, which is that uh, you have these nodes and you have all these lines between nodes. And I mean, you might imagine that this is depicting something where these nodes are doing some complicated processing and a lot of information exchange. But really this is kind of a, a, a perhaps a silly way of writing the process of doing some matrix multiplication, applying a nonlinearity, doing another matrix multiplication, applying another nonlinearity, and, and so on. And then eventually you get to some output and you want to train your networks. You want to learn the parameters. The parameters are these matrices W and vectors B so that uh, you fit the data. And fitting the data might mean, say, classifying images as cats or dogs. It might mean, as we'll talk about later, uh, predicting the next word to appear in a sentence. Um, it might mean generating an image or doing something even more complicated like playing Go. But effectively, you're just trying to make predictions with this very general uh, function approximator. And so uh, what are the ingredients that you need to uh, uh, to get the ball rolling. Say you have some problem and you, you thought maybe I'll apply machine learning to it. What, what do you actually need? Well, there's kind of three things that you have to decide on. Um, you have to decide what is the data? Uh, what kind of data is it? Um, you wanna know and it'll be relevant how much data you, you have. And what about the data are you trying to predict? Are you trying to predict whether an image is a cat or a dog? Or are you trying to generate new images of cats and dogs that no one has ever seen before, cats and dogs that, that have never lived. Um, if you want to make some decision about, about that, um, you'll make some kind of decision about the neural network architecture and the size of the neural network. And what that means uh, very concretely is what matrices are you using? How big are those matrices? How exactly do you multiply them and apply nonlinearities to, 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 to get to some sort of final answer? Um, and overall, you can count how many numbers are there in all of the matrices and vectors. There are the parameters that you're going to learn. 
And that gives you some overall parameter count for the neural network. And that's going to appear uh, uh, later on in, in this talk. I'll talk a lot about model size. And by model size, um, essentially what I mean is the total number of, uh, of floating point numbers that uh, are in all of these matrices that make up the neural network architecture. And the goal, of course, is to learn those parameters from the data to model the data well. Um, and then finally, you have to decide on a loss function, which if you're, if, you're, if you're very much coming from physics, you might think of as a potential, like a potential energy. Um, there's a loss function, and the goal is to minimize that. And the loss function just measures how far are you from modeling the data well. And uh, the, way that you, the way that you learn is basically just to, in little steps, um, minimize the loss function uh, bit by bit by typically taking some kind of gradient step in the direction that, that decreases the loss. And so that means, of course, that it's important and useful to be able to differentiate the loss with respect to the neural network parameters. That's something that uh, if you really get involved in, in machine learning, um, uh, something to keep track of, can I actually differentiate the loss so that I can, I can learn? Um, and that's really uh, kind of all there is to it. If I mean, you could try to apply machine learning to a scientific problem or any other problem. Um, uh, once you can answer these these questions, um, so again, sort of as a as a as a theoretical physicist, um, we're known for uh, liking to make order of magnitude estimates, and so I think it's it's useful to sort of go through and think what are the order of magnitudes of the various ingredients that go into to contemporary machine learning, and it's, it's it, they're really large. Um, so the, the toy data set for the machine learning community is the MNIST data set, which uh, you have examples from it uh, uh, in, in sort of the top left. These are just little numerals, um, handwritten numerals. And the, the task is, uh, is, is what you guess, uh, classify them as 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. Um, and that data set is very, very small by kind of uh, uh, contemporary standards. Um, it has about 50,000 images, so that's fairly small, and there are these little 28 by 28 pixel images. So they have almost 800 pixels per image, um, but that, that, that's quite small. Um, and I mean, typically now there are, are many, many papers where researchers work with data sets that are vastly larger with something like 100 million images or, or even a billion images. Um, and there are maybe photorealistic images, so they have something like a million pixels per image. So, those are those are some uh, some numbers. Um, I'll talk about equivalent numbers for language when when we get there. Um, uh, other examples that you may have heard of in machine learning are, are say uh, AlphaGo, um, famously uh, achieving superhuman performance at, at Go, and uh, and you can very roughly I think AlphaGo played something like a thousand times more games than a very devoted human professional could play in a lifetime. So uh, so it's a lot of games of Go uh, that it played to learn Go. Um, there is an open AI, uh, AI that played something like 10,000 years of a popular uh, uh, multiplayer uh, uh, strategy game called Dota. Um, uh, no human plays Dota for 10,000 years straight, um, but uh, these AIs do to, to learn. Um, and uh, some other kinds of uh, numbers that you can ask about are how big are the neural networks? And you can make a neural network as small as you like. Um, you can do uh, you can do very well at say classifying those MNIST digits with with without a ton of parameters. But the largest models that have been trained so far, I think, have about uh, on the order of 100 billion uh, 100 billion parameters. Uh, maybe getting up to towards a trillion uh, soon, if, uh, uh, if if not already, depending on uh, what what exactly you count. Um, and uh, and just as a point of comparison, very very roughly again, as a, as a physicist and not a, I'm not a neuroscientist, human brain has something like 10 to the 15 synapses. And I'm listing that along with neural network parameters because there's a sense in which parameters are sort of uh, uh, maps from uh, of information from sort of uh, uh, one one component of one vector to another. So I think there's there's a little bit of an analogy there. Um, so kind of interesting to compare. Um, uh, I I grabbed a picture from the internet of a V100 uh, GPU, which is uh, uh, one of the fairly state-of-the-art GPUs that's uh, used for their ability to perform a lot of operations in parallel um, in training machine learning uh, uh, models. And um, these, these GPUs can perform something like 10 to the 14 floating point operations per second, um, which, I mean, it's just kind of amazing. Um, I mean, uh, 
as a, as, a, as a species, we sort of didn't have computers a uh, hundred years ago, and now we already have computers that, that that can do these things. And that means that by training with many GPUs for for a while, um, some of the largest ML models, these largest neural networks, have something like getting close to an Avogadro's number of floating point computations that are performed in order to train them. Um, and I think this estimate is much probably more uncertain and, and, and maybe neuroscientists uh, uh, would, would, have, would, would disagree, but there's some very vague order of magnitude estimate that maybe in a lifetime, a human brain does something like an, anal an analog of something like 10 to the 25 uh, computation. So we're sort of in an interesting regime and these numbers are, are, are very, very uh, big. Um, so uh, one last point about this, just sort of about the growth of this field and specifically computation. Um, the y-axis here is petaflop per second days. So it's uh, 10 to the 15 operations per second times a day. Um, uh, so that's a, a, lot of, a lot of computation. And this is sort of a plot of kind of some of the biggest state-of-the-art machine learning experiments uh, uh, in the last few years. And you can see that very, very quickly and exponentially, uh, the amount of computation people are spending on machine learning uh, is growing. And it, it can probably keep growing for, for, for a while longer. Um, so there are a lot of big numbers involved. It's not just big data, but there's also very large networks and very, very large amounts of computation uh, used to train those networks. So uh, what about uh, language models and why should we think about language and, uh, and, and what AI should we use uh, to approach it? Um, so there are a lot of interesting reasons, I think, to, to, to study language. Here are a few. Um, one is that I think Language is sort of our species' best attempt to encode everything there is about to say about the world, to be able to describe the world in its entirely um, as efficiently as possible. And so that means that uh, there is probably not a ton of noise in language, and uh, and it's it's a very powerful, uh, very powerful medium. Um, another benefit is that there's a lot of writing freely available on the internet, and if you just I don't have access to the Library of Congress, but if you did, the Library of Congress has something like 10 million books. Maybe it has something like a trillion words in it. So there's a lot, uh, that's probably all a very high quality language data. And there's a lot more low quality language data sort of sort of freely available. Um, and another reason is that if, if you really can make a lot of progress uh, teaching an AI uh, language, then an AI that knows all that language can sort of be asked anything. Um, you can get a lot of intuition from its responses about what exactly it is and isn't uh, isn't doing, both from its successes and and its mistakes, um, in a way that I think is not quite as as, as easy if you're say uh, looking at Go moves or or just classifying classifying images, just just because of the breadth of, of the domain, um, and also it it might make it easier to sort of figure out how to control uh, what AIs are are doing if they if they understand them. Um, so those are some motivations for studying language. Um, I'll actually talk about some other data distributions as well. Um, but, but, but those are some reasons to be excited. Um, so how do you train a, a model to learn language? Well, there, there are many different approaches to this depending on exactly what you want. Um, but the approach that I'll talk about is uh, autoregressive prediction of the next word. Um, so this equation that I've written here, it, the, what it's supposed to be representing is, Say I see a sentence, it has words one through N in that sentence, and I wanna predict what the next word is. And there's some conditional probability distribution given the sentence I've seen so far of what the next N plus one word is supposed to be. And um, if you have a model that can make these predictions, then you can train it to maximize the probability that the next word is in fact predicted correctly. So you can optimize the log, log of the likelihood of the real world text. And that's that's your training signal. That's the right answer. And sometimes this is called unsupervised learning because uh, you're just letting the, the, the model uh, learn the probability distribution of, of sort of all text. Um, you could, but it's not so different from so-called supervised learning in the sense that uh, you really have a bunch of very, very clear targets. Whatever text you've seen so far, you're trying to predict the next word. And so uh, if you're a speak speaker at a journal club, you probably don't expect elephant um, to be said, like you didn't expect me to say elephant right there. And so if you ask a, a powerful language model uh, the same question, it, it will agree with you. So if you write as a speaker at a journal club, you're probably elephant me to say certain things. Um, you can ask, what was the probability that the model, uh, 
uh, literally, what was the probability that it thought the next word after probably was going to be elephant? And uh, and the answer was, uh, well, it was zero to certain precision. If you look it up, it was something like 10 to the minus eight. Um, all of the words it did expect made sense in that sentence, like you're probably not, you're probably going, you're probably used used to. Um, so it it had a bunch of very reasonable suggestions and, uh, and it was very surprised by, by elephant. And that's a sense in which how these, uh, how these models are trained, they're being trained to make accurate and, and if they have enough data, well calibrated predictions about uh, what the next what the next word can be, and that is it. Um, there is no other objective. There's no other sort of uh, 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 there's no other other sort of babysitting of of the models that I'm going to discuss. They're just trained to predict the next word in text. So a couple more details about uh, about this. Um, so one question you might have is how do I turn words into something that a machine learning algorithm, a neural network can process? And uh, the basic idea is that you have some, you break words up into some set of tokens, which are either characters or words or different kinds of subword units. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't matter so much. Um, and then you embed all of these words in a high dimensional vector space. So there's just some big matrix that takes each word and turns it into some high dimensional vector. That vector itself is learned. And uh, you, you, you have this embedding space. And embedding space is kind of interesting. It has some interesting structure there where like king minus queen might be the same vector as man minus woman, uh, et cetera. The other feature, so there, there have been many kinds of language models that, that have, have existed. Um, one that, that you may have heard of from, that, that's been known for a while is called an LSTM. And it does something that I think is pretty intuitive. Um, it goes through the sentence, it reads a word, it makes a prediction about the next word. It sees what what the what what that word was. It has some memory about what's going on. Makes another prediction, and it proceeds sequentially through the sentence, making predictions at each word. Um, that's one model. Um, but the kinds of models that I'll actually be talking about are called transformers, which work a little bit differently. Um, they work via self-attention, and the idea there is sort of what's what's pictured in this figure that if you're asked to predict. Uh, uh, the next word, say criminal, um, on the sixth or seventh line in this, you're trying to predict the, the word criminal, given the FBI is chasing A, um, you might go through what, what occurred in the sentence so far and kind of highlight the things that you think are relevant for what the prediction should be, grab them, and then think about them a bit, um, and then make your prediction. And uh, that's effectively exactly what, what transformers are doing. They sort of do this process repeatedly over and over and over again, refining uh, their thoughts about, uh, about uh, what to predict. Um, and then finally, they, they make a prediction. So they're working sort of as a highlighter over all of the previous text, rather than just sort of reading words one, one at a time. Um, so uh, I'll mostly be talking about transformers throughout this, uh, this discussion. Um, and uh, this is sort of the most technical slide. Um, I'll just give it sort of a 30 second, uh, 30 second description. How do you actually do this highlighting? Um, and, and feel free to sort of nap through this, this discussion. But how do you do this highlighting? Well, you can take words like criminal and FBI and map their vectors to some comparison space and then look at the inner, their inner product in that comparison space. And if their inner product in that comparison space is big, then you grab FBI and you say, oh, FBI is going to be very useful for predicting the next word is criminal. Um, and maybe the, as in the FBI, isn't that useful, and so you don't grab it. So um, this is sort of the, the math involved in how you do this self-attention in order to grab, uh, uh, in order to do this kind of uh, highlighting. Um, <clears throat> great. So. Uh, uh, I mentioned that you don't have to talk about language in this way. So uh, you don't have to just talk about language, you talk about uh, many, many different data distributions in this way. And so these are two different examples of very big, powerful transformers. On the left, you have a sample entirely ge generated after the, the title and author by GPT-3. Um, so GPT-3 wrote a Wallace Stevens poem for us. Um, and on the right, you have a bunch of examples of a uh, <coughs> image GPT model um, completing images. So on the left uh, of the, the sort of image grid, you have half completed images. And this image model is pixel by pixel, one at a time, um, generating the remainder, the bottom half of all these images. And you can sort of see what it does. You can see that it's really capturing a lot of very, very interesting non-trivial structure in, uh, in image distribution. So um, maybe I'll pause and ask, are there uh, 
any questions. I see one question in, in chat, which is, do we know how humans make predictions? Is it transformer-like? Um, I, I basically, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, uh, I think uh, it's a great question. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I don't think I have anything very, very smart to say about it. Um, great. In practice, is the transfer seeing only a single sentence at a time? So the models that I'll be discussing here are seeing about 1,500 words at a time. Um, so that's many, many, many paragraphs. And that enables them to really understand kind of long context information. And it'll be crucial for, uh, for, for some of the discussion uh, near the end, later in, in the talk. Any other questions? You certainly can use this to look at all sorts of complex dynamics. I don't know how well we'll do. Um, uh, the limitations as we'll sort of discuss uh, with, with scaling laws are sort of how much data do you have? Um, but if you have, a, if you have a lot of data, then, then, then you certainly can. Um, and very briefly, when you talk about scaling, I'll talk about solving procedurally generated math questions. Um, things like uh, take the derivative of this polynomial or, uh, or what's the probability that, that, that seven coins flipped in a particular way come up with three heads, uh, things like that. Um, uh, these, these models actually, actually can succeed at. Any other questions? Maybe one last comment about this slide. I think it actually, I think the, the poems that GPT-3 can write are very impressive. Um, that's at least, the, at least my view. I think it's one of the strongest things that one of the thing, places where GPT-3 is sort of most impressive. Um, and I think it, that sort of makes sense because in something like poetry, um, and maybe also in image generation, there's a lot of subtle correlations matter. A lot of illusions matter. And that's something that the models are, are really good at capturing. And, and typically where these models are actually weakest is at sort of understanding logical inference. Yeah, so someone asks, can a single transformer generate multiple outputs? Yes. So what's going on here in both cases, uh, uh, language and, and images, is that the transformer is, is modeling the probability distribution over the next word or the next pixel. That means that you can sample from that distribution. So the way that all of this is generated on the slide is that you give the transformer the context, what it's seen so far, it tells you what the probability distribution is over the next word. You sample randomly from that distribution. You feed it back to the transformer and ask it to make another prediction of the next probability distribution for the next position until you fill out the image or, or have written all that you want. Uh, so I think if you go to windows much, much larger than the model, simply these models that I'm, I'm talking about simply don't know. They can't see anything outside their windows. So typically, uh, uh, certainly the model is not going to be great. It's not going to use any context that's, that's outside of its window. It doesn't have any way of remembering, remembering that information. Um, it may go off the rails. It may just decide that it's going to end the document it's working on and start a new document um, because that's, that's the kind of thing that can happen, can happen during training. Other, other questions? Okay, great. So I'll move on and talk about uh, scaling laws for uh, language models and, and neural models in general. So what's the motivation? So I'll give you sort of uh, a very, very big picture motivation, um, which I think is was relevant for me though, as a physicist in thinking about what, what the machine learning field sort of is. Um, so there's a big question that, that you can ask, which is sort of why does machine learning work so well? Um, if you're impressed by, by, by the last slide, um, what matters um, in machine learning and, and sort of what doesn't matter as, as much? And I think this, this is uh, very important if you're thinking about like what research problems should I work on um, and what should I expect uh, this field to look like in the future? Um, what, what should I expect to happen? And specifically maybe because I come from theoretical physics, I was I, I have in mind a question like this, like is making progress on AI kind of like pro proving the Riemann hypothesis in that it requires a few brilliant geniuses to devote their entire life to obsessing over a very, very hard problem that no one without a tremendous amount of background can sort of possibly, uh, possibly understand. Um, uh, like imagine Andrew Wiles proving Fermat's last theorem, or, or is it more like say building a more powerful steam engine where there are kind of simple general principles, there are certain kinds of fundamental limitations like 
laws of thermodynamics. And then beyond that, there's there's basically some kind of uh, uh, simple things you can do, like where you scale things, you work on efficiency questions like that. And uh, and while I mean I I think this this is perhaps a controversial question, maybe the jury's still out. I'm I'm definitely going to be arguing that it's much more like uh, like the second, um, as as sort of surprising as as that that might be. Um, and so. Uh, Specifically, I'll be talking about scaling laws uh, for uh, for neural network training and, and and machine learning. So I'll be arguing that there are precise scaling laws for the performance of these uh, uh, neural networks as a function of things like the number of model parameters, the size of the data set, and even the total amount of computation that was used to train the, to train the models. And I think that's actually kind of the tip of the iceberg. I think there are a lot of other phenomena like this that involve trading off different other factors, uh, factors related to the architecture, um, uh, the loss, the particular, all, all sorts of different ingredients that you, that you might imagine uh, uh, go, into, go into these models in, in more detail. Um, but, but I'll be talking about, uh, about these features. Um, also sort of make the claim that some of the other details don't matter that much. Um, and that, I mean, they definitely matter, but, uh, but they, don't, they don't matter sort of in this sort of macroscopic point of view. And often what they, what, what even sort of fairly big changes uh, uh, in, in algorithms do is, is change something like a important prefactor in some otherwise relatively, uh, relatively fixed, uh, fixed scaling law. Um, and I think also uh, uh, a point of view that this suggests is that sort of improving uh, how well you can do um, with, with these networks, a lot of it involves sort of avoiding various kinds of bottlenecks. And there are sort of very basic bottlenecks, like you just don't have enough data. So that's bottlenecking how well you can do. You don't have, you don't have a big enough network or you don't have enough computation to, to, to train a big enough network. Um, and then I think there are also literal kind of bottlenecks um, that, uh, that involve just sort of bad information propagation. Um, and I think a lot of the most highly cited papers in machine learning from the last decade really are about resolving these bottlenecks. Things like residual networks, transformers, uh, batch norm, um, many other, many of these different different things um, are really sort of getting at at uh, at sort of making sure that information propagates through the network effectively, so that it can it can learn effectively and sort of use all of its parameters. And there's this extremely toy version of what what this might mean, which is that if you take a matrix. And you raise it to the power of a thousand because you have, say, a thousand layers or something. Um, then typically you'll be dominated by the biggest eigenvalue of that matrix and its eigenspace, and so information won't be very well well propagated or preserved. And so I think, in a very toy sense, uh, a lot of a lot of big developments are really about kind of ameliorating this this kind of issue. Um, so that's the sort of global viewpoint that I'll I'll be I'll be claiming. Um, so now I just sort of want to show you a lot of uh, empirical data. Um, so uh, these are some results on uh, scaling for language models, um, where you just train many different models of different sizes on different amounts of data in, in various, various different ways. Now, in all of these plots, the y-axis is the test loss, um, and that's the logarithm of the probability that, uh, that the model uh, uh, assigns to the correct next token. Um, you can also think about this as as, as some sort of compress uh, the degree to which the model is able to compress the information in 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 natural language. Um, so let's just sort of look at, at at these in turn. So on the far right, um, we Sorry, have well while you're while you're at this, um, it, do the units mean something? Or I mean, obviously there there is some way of doing this in which the units mean something, but. Yeah, great question. So, uh, so here, this is the loss with respect to tokens. Um, uh, I'm not going to go into the tokenization, but a token is about uh, it's about sort of 60% of a word on average. So, if you multiply this by like something like 1.4, um, then you'll get something like uh, uh, the log of the the average of the log of the probability that the model assigned to the actual next word in the text. Um, and I mean, that's my, it's the my, master log. Sorry, there's a, there's a negative sign presumably. Yeah, there's there's yeah there's a there's a negative sign yeah because log of a number less than right. one is negative yeah so but, it's, it's so fine. these are numbers of order one. Yeah. So that's saying that doing well is is knowing the next word 
reducing the next word down to a few alternatives. Yeah, um, I think so. I mean, something we can go into is that uh, there's there's certainly intrinsic entropy in in language in the sense that it's not like language is actually deterministic, so you can't get down to zero. Um, and and I mean. Certainly what's what's shown in this plot is you can do significantly better than what's shown in the plot because it looks like, I mean, the trend is probably going to continue, but uh, but yeah, this is doing well is something like two gnats uh, uh, of, of, of entropy per, per token or something like that. Maybe three gnats of entropy per word um, in, in, in these units. And has somebody done um, Shannon's guessing game with words so that we know how people do? Um, I don't think anyone's done it very precisely. I think I, my sense is that people by themselves, I have some friends who've tried this a little bit. I think people by themselves are actually probably a lot worse than the models. Um, and uh, uh, maybe by, because I think people are sort of looking for something else other than perfect prediction of the next word. Um, but uh, I don't know for sure. I think maybe an interesting question is like, if you have a person work together with a model, sort of how much can the person make do improve the performance of the model? Um, but I think it's, it's hard to measure. I think it would be really interesting to measure. I think it would be fascinating. Um, let's see. Yeah, so uh, someone asks about other languages. Um, I think this is true for, for any language. Um, if you have different kinds of languages with different kinds of word units, then you have to, you have to model the tokens in a different way. But, uh, but I, I would be very confident that these scaling laws apply in, in, in any language. And actually, the models are trained here are not pure English. They're predominantly English, but they have, uh, they have a similar behavior. I don't know if they're the same exponents. Um, for uh, images versus language, there's definitely different exponents. So the exponents definitely depend on the data distribution. So I would imagine that for different languages, there will be slightly different exponents. I would be surprised if they're very different, but, but I could be wrong. Um, but anyway, let's, let's explain the plots before, uh, uh, before, before, before going into too much more detail. Um, on the right, you have uh, test loss um, versus the number of parameters in many different models that were all trained uh, on the same objective with uh, effectively an infinite amount of data, way more data than they need. They're not overfitting at, at all. Um, uh, and uh, they, they also were able to train for a very long time, essentially to convergence. Um, and so you see that there's this very, very clean power law trend over many four or five, six orders of magnitude um, uh, in, 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 in model size. Um, and uh, and it's, it's very precise. I mean, I, I at least find it very, very striking. It's the kind of thing you expect from like a physics experiment, not, uh, not from something, it's, it's not something you have to sort of squint or, or, or squiggle uh, about. Um, in the middle, we have exactly the same kind of experiment, except here we're changing the data set size. We're using a model, which is a very, very, very big model, um, so that model size is not limiting the performance. Um, we're doing early stopping, which just means that we stop training when the test loss is at a minimum. Um, and you also see there's this uh, similarly very clean power law trend with, uh, with, with data set size. Um, and finally, the most complicated plot is on the left. This is with respect to compute. So all of the blue curves here are uh, uh, learning curves for models of different size. And the reason why they're sort of shifted to the left and the right is that bigger models use more computation uh, on every data point that they see, on every word that they see, they, 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 they use more computation, basically because all of the parameters in the model do something when you, when you run the model. Um, and so uh, the amount of compute per word is proportional to, to, to model size. Um, and so these are all these different learning curves. The bigger models are off to the right because they take more compute to train, but they also eventually perform much better. Um, again, on the, uh, for this plot on the left, we have, we have eventually infinite data. There's no, there's no overfitting here. And the dashed orange curve is, the, uh, is sort of the frontier of what's the optimum uh, performance that you can get for a given amount of compute. And, the interesting thing here is that as a function of the amount of computation you do during, during training, um, the computational budget, uh, you see a different optimal model size um, uh, for that different amount of computation. When you have more compute, you want to use a bigger model. When you have less compute, you want to use uh, a smaller model. And, and here, like I said, it's, it's crucial that in each case, only the thing on the x-axis is bottlenecking performance.
Um, and, and the units here are in petaflop days, which are something like almost 10 to the 20 floating point operations. This is all for, for transformers. Um, I'll address other architectures uh, uh, soon. Um, and, and one more thing, all of these exponents are very small. All of these exponents for language are very small. For images, they're not as small. Um, they're more like, say, 0.2. But uh, but yeah, they're all they're all pretty small. And I mean, I guess if you do a different problem and get a bigger exponent, maybe that answers the question. But sometimes when you see very small exponents, you might worry that you're really seeing a log. Yeah. So we thought, I mean, historically, when we were doing this research, we thought for a while it was a log. And a log fits. Uh, very clearly not as well to to the data, but it's a it's a great question. And yeah, that we, we for a while ourselves were thinking, oh, it's a log. A log has certain properties that were very exciting, like it hits zero at a finite value of parameter size and compute, which means that you can predict how big of a model do you need to get essentially perfect performance. Um, but I, I don't think it is a log. I think it, it log just doesn't fit as well. Great. Um, so uh, this this uh, sort of cartoonized plot is what you get from reading out the compute plot on the left and looking for what is the optimal model size as a function of compute, right? Because on that on that plot on the left, you had all these different models. You could pick for a given computational budget for training what was the best model size to use to get the, the best value of, of the loss. And what this shows is sort of how you should increase model size versus other things uh, as you increase the compute budget. And I think a fairly surprising uh, lesson was that mostly you should crank up model size. So in log space, you should sort of use two thirds of the computational budget on, uh, on increased model size and only a third on more data slash uh, uh, more, more training. Um, and so uh, uh, that, that's sort of an interesting thing. And we're gonna, we're gonna come back to that uh, again later you talk about other kinds of data. So someone asked about, is this all transformers? So this is a comparison of the, the transformer results uh, as a function of model size um, to some LSTMs. And um, I guess there, there are two points being made in this, in this uh, plot that are almost sort of a, a little bit in tension. The one is that at least for a, a wide range, um, at least by I, the LSTMs are sort of doing worse by something like a constant overall factor. Um, the LSTMs are worse. Transformers were this huge leap forward in terms of, uh, in terms of language modeling. Um, but actually, in terms of the scaling exponent, the LSTMs uh, look to be quite, quite, quite similar over, over a wide range. Um, I think eventually they'll, they'll get worse um, for the reason that's sort of shown on the, on the plot at right which is that LSTMs have this uh, information uh, propagation problem that, uh, that, I, that I mentioned. LSTMs literally sort of read, read each word at a time and then try to remember everything that's relevant uh, to their future predictions. And, um, and so there's a sense in which they have this sort of something like this matrix multiplication problem. Um, and they're not as good at, uh, at attending or, or understanding very, very long context correlations in uh, in the in the data, and so on the right, you see sort of red versus blue are some similarly sized LSTMs and transformers, um, and you see the transformer sort of keeps improving as you as it sees more and more data in its context uh, in its context window. Um, so that the x-axis on the right is how many tokens uh, have been seen before it makes that prediction. And of course, more tokens means better performance. But the LSTM sort of plateaus. And so it's not really able to capture really, really long context uh, context correlations. Um, and uh, so one one interpretation of, of these these results is to say, well, even, even the difference in LSTMs and transformers, it's not uh, in sort of the very big picture sense, it's not such a huge, huge difference. The scaling law is the same. It just differs by the scaling exponent is the same. Just differs by by a prefactor, and uh, I mean these, the the sort of bottom plots are a bunch of different detailed examples of further evidence just within the transformer that a lot of the other hyperparameters that you can tweak don't make such a huge difference. So you can uh, maybe maybe the most interesting version of this is the middle plot, which is how wide the model is divided by how deep it is. Um, we often talk about how how these, these machine learning models are so deep. So you can change you can trade depth for width. Um, width means making sort of the matrices bigger. Depth basically means multiplying more matrices. And uh, 
And you can see that, I mean, the, the y-axis here is like a few percent increase in the loss. And you see that within sort of an order of magnitude variation of the width versus, uh, versus depth, um, you only sort of hurt performance by, uh, by a couple percent. Um, so of course it matters, you probably wanna optimize this, but uh, it's not really the sort of crucial uh, determinant, determining factor of, of sort of what these models can do. Um, so uh, uh, that's architecture. Um, another question you might wonder about is like, uh, I showed these, these, these plots of uh, loss versus position in context. Uh, which are kind of interesting because uh, they're a case where there, there can be nice uh, scaling, but I think it really depends on the data distribution. Um, uh, the, the, the results I've set up to now, I think uh, mostly, mostly kind of don't, um, but, but loss versus position in context does. So in language, um, I, I, a plausible hypothesis is that there are sort of power law type correlations um, between between different words in, in in language, and we see something very much like that on this sort of top left plot, where the loss is going down as the model gets to read more and more and has more contextual information for making its next next prediction. So we have different model sizes of, as different colors, and then the x-axis is sort of token position. And so there's a very smooth, nice uh, uh, result that the model seems to be learning some kind of power law uh, 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 correlations, and in contrast, when we look at images at the bottom, um, with images, we're modeling them pixel by pixel by pixel, but the loss is definitely depends on where you are in the image, not on just sort of how many pixels you've seen. And as you might expect, in the middle of the image, there's sort of more non-trivial information. And so the model, uh, 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 so the loss is higher in the middle than sort of near the background. Um, so that's the kind of thing. Some things are fairly universal, but some things are not. And this is an example of something that, that definitely isn't, uh, isn't universal. Um, there's some multivariable scaling laws. I think I maybe won't uh, belabor this just to make sure that, that we have enough time. But uh, uh, of course, you, you may be interested in things like varying the size of the data set and the size of the model. You might be interested in figuring out how much data do I need for a given model, et cetera. And, there are very nice predictive scaling laws for these kinds of multivariable uh, dependencies, and you can use them to say predict how much overfitting uh, you will actually see with 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 a finite a finite data set. Um, uh, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll I'll take some questions. Uh, looks like there is a question. Uh, yeah, so someone's asking maybe predicting the next word isn't isn't the right thing exactly, or maybe it's better to predict something further downstream. Uh, and maybe the prediction quality is heterogeneous. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think this is a great question. Like, uh, like, like, what is the variance in the loss? Um, I don't have too much to say. I think if we could find an objective to learn that was much, much better, um, we would. Now, there is another objective that's very often seen where uh, with like BERT models and others use, which is instead of uh, predicting the next word, you just mask out, you take a, a long sequence of text and you just mask out some parts of the text and you ask the model to sort of predict what's missing and it gets to use the words in the future and and in the past with respect to these these mass, mass areas. And uh, that objective for, for, for certain kinds of purposes can actually give you better performance by something like a factor of a few. Um, uh, so these are good questions, but uh, uh, but yeah, I don't have I, I don't have anything uh, a lot more to say to, to say about that. And I would strongly suspect that those kinds of models also would see similar kinds of scaling laws um, with respect to their loss. Um, okay, so some further questions about these scaling laws. Everything I've shown you so far was for language. So uh, three questions: Was this specific to just the language data distribution? Um, will it break down uh, eventually? Um, do these scaling laws break down? And what about things that you actually care about? You might not worry, care about predicting the next word. You do care about predicting the next word if you want to generate sort of machine written text. But other than that, you, you care about other things like can the model answer questions? Can it, uh, can it find things for you? Can it do arithmetic? Um, things like that. And, uh, uh, and so, so we'll talk about those, those kind, of, kind of downstream tasks uh, 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 in the future. So, um, the quick answer to does this generalize to other data distributions is yes. Um, and so this is, uh, uh, these are all compute plots for 
uh, five different kinds of data distributions. Um, so always on the y-axis, there's a test loss, although uh, embarrassingly in this cartoon version, there's no, uh, there's no scale. Um, but here you have videos where you're predicting the, the video in a crazy, silly way, pixel by individual pixel. You have images where you're predicting, where you're generating or predicting images pixel by pixel. You have math, which means uh, solving uh, a large difference, a large number, fairly diverse set of procedurally generated math problems um, spanning algebra, number theory, calculus, uh, probability, um, many other things like that. Um, uh, you have multimodal models, which are predicting images from text or predicting text from images. And then you have an extension of the, the text results that I showed before to even larger models. And uh, the color here, yellow means bigger models and purple means smaller models. And the claim is that, that in terms of compute and, and also in terms of the other scaling laws, but I'm just not showing the plots, um, these kind of scaling laws seem to apply uh, to, to sort of all of these different uh, distributions. And they're all approached in the same way of sort of predicting, predicting the next word. Um, maybe, uh, maybe even more surprising than that is you can actually put all of these on the same plot. So I mentioned in, in the last set of plots that I didn't label the y-axis. And it wouldn't make sense to put the plots uh, from the last slide on the same axis because a pixel of a video doesn't mean the same thing as a word. So uh, it just wouldn't, wouldn't be sensible to, uh, to compare the, the loss on a pixel to the loss on a word. However, it does make, uh, make a lot of sense to, per, to, to compare the optimal model size versus the compute budget for all these data distributions. Because uh, model size and computer are just directly fairly comparable between these distributions. Um, and that's something that you can read off from the plots in the last slide by asking for each compute budget, what is the optimal, uh, optimal model size? And I, I was quite surprised that the answer is, I mean, to within some, some variation, uh, it seems like there's some kind of universal trend that the optimal model size uh, scales with compute in a very, very particular uh, universal way, uh, independent uh, for the most part of, of the, the data distribution. Um, so uh, that is that is uh, that is very universal. So what about downstream tasks? So I'm going to talk a lot more about that when I talk about GPT-3. But um, uh, one kind of downstream task that uh, is a very very famous uh, common objective in machine learning is to classify images. We trained models to predict the next pixel in an image so that it can generate the image pixel by pixel. Um, but you can take those models that are predicting pixels, you can cut off their heads, you can cut off the part of the model that predicts the next pixel, and just glue on one big matrix that, uh, that takes the, the, uh, the vectors the model produces and tries to classify them uh, as one of a thousand different types of images. So there's this very famous image uh, data set called ImageNet. Um, uh, and uh, there's a version of it scaled down to 32 by 32 resolution because that's what, that's what we were using. And you can just fine tune the, the, these models that were trained to understand images to classify them instead. And what you, what you find is that uh, performance at this uh, downstream task of classification instead of generation um, also has a very nice uh, power law scaling, even when you ask for sort of the error rate rather than the loss. Um, Furthermore, this pre-training is a very good thing to do. It, uh, it improves performance um, uh, in the sense that uh, if you try to train just from scratch on ImageNet, you have a problem with overfitting when you have a really big model, um, uh, as, as Surya mentioned. But uh, if you pre-train the model so that it kind of understands images first and then ask it to classify, then basically this sort of nice trend continues down to uh, to very, very big models that have very good performance uh, uh, at this task. So bigger models are predictably doing better, not just at uh, the thing that they were originally trained on, but also at tasks that they are fine-tuned uh, uh, to perform. So uh, uh, I mentioned um, that I'm mostly talking about scaling laws in things like model size, compute, and data set size, but I think scaling laws are sort of everywhere. So this is an example that I just think is cute, at least if you're interested, if you like information theory. Um, a multimodal model takes an image and predicts a caption 
uh, just a general random natural language caption, um, or it takes uh, a caption or, or, or some sentences and tries to generate an image based on, based on that text. And so you can ask, what is the mutual information between the text and the image in these kinds of models? Like literally in terms of information, how much does the text tell you about the image or how much does the image tell you about the text? And uh, this seems to exhibit uh, this quantity, the mutual information itself has some nice scaling property with model size. I think it actually has some relation to some of the other scaling properties. Um, but in any case, it, uh, as you can see, just empirically, um, this mutual information is growing smoothly and predictably with, uh, with, with model size. Um, uh, so I just think that's kind of cool. Sorry, I must admit I'm, I'm confused about what you're plotting here. So yep. I have an ensemble of images with, so, so Yeah, uh, sorry. Can so I can, I can I can go through it in more detail. So let's let's take this a text to image case. So I have a model that was trained to see text and uh, predict all of the pixels in the corresponding image. Yes. Um, I can take that same model and I can uh, we we did a couple of different things, and this is really just sort of to to make sure we're not uh, we're not lying to ourselves. You can also train that model on some fraction of the data where it just doesn't see any text at all and it just predicts the image. So you can, in other words, you can train it on sort of a mixture of text and image and then just nothing and image, just so that you know that when it sees nothing, nothing isn't out of distribution. Then you can empirically compute the loss uh, of, of, the of both of the model when it sees the text and predicts an image, or it sees a blank, no text, and tries to, to predict the image. And you can then subtract those empirical losses. So this is really an empirical mutual information. You can subtract those empirical losses. And the loss for the model that gets to read the text is consistently lower than the loss for the model that just sees, uh, sees no text at all. And this mutual information that I'm plotting is the, is the difference between those two. Does that I make sense? I'm, I guess I'm having trouble. I mean, so. Oh, I see. So the, the the model has an estimate for the probabilities. Yeah, the model is predicting the probability of every so you, pixel. And so you use that to compute the mutual information. Exactly, exactly. The so, model is literally a model. You possibly model. sample to do this, right? Yeah, you do not need to sample. You just use data okay. in, in your test set. Um, okay. and so this is, this is kind of internal to the model, but average, the, the conditional probability is from the model. But yes. Then the, but then exactly, okay. exactly. So that so that's why I said it's the empirical mutual information because okay. you're using yeah. Great. Any any other questions? Cool. So so this is sort of the models, the bigger models learning more about how words describe images. Um. um so uh, uh, how do you get eight eight bits or eight nats? Um. Uh. No, it's uh, it's it's th this is the total mutual information over the entire image. So it's the sum of uh, the uh, logs of probabilities over a minus sign over all of the pixels in the image. So these are thirty-two by thirty-two. Cool. Um, so what happens? So if you if you sort of uh, believe believe what's what's going on so far. Um, uh, uh, at least at, at sort of a GWIS level, you might ask what happens if we just keep this going and sort of train larger language models and sort of uh, follow, follow along these, these trends. And so uh, this is sort of a, a more detailed version of, of a plot that you, you briefly got a, got a glimpse of before. Um, so in the first paper we wrote about this subject, um, we stopped at models that had about a billion parameters. Um, but then there was this uh, GPD-3 series of models going up to about 175 billion parameters. And this sort of compute trend seems like it, it, it effectively uh, continued um, uh, for, that, for the next three or so orders of magnitude uh, in, in, in terms of compute budget. So um, these are, this is the compute scaling law all the way for uh, out to, to GPD-3. Seems like it's basically continuing. It's possible GPD-3 is underperforming the trend very slightly. Um, that could mean many different things, but it's it's really just kind of hard to tell uh, from 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 that from that one curve. Um, so uh, scaling laws seem like they continue. 
um, what else can this really big model uh, do? So uh, uh, a property of it that, that sort of seems to emerge uh, automatically um, when you train this, this very, very large model is that it, it's able to do in-context learning, which means that if it sees a sequence, it's, it sees a few arithmetic problems or anagrams or say translation examples from English to French, um, then uh, if it sees those, once it's trained just in its context window, it, it reads them kind of like a person would. And then you give it another example, like uh, unscramble this, this string of, of letters into a word, then it figures out uh, uh, how to do that and, and how to do it correctly. Um, so uh, this is a plot um, that shows uh, several different model sizes, a billion parameter model, a sort of 13 billion parameter model, and uh, a 7, 175 billion parameter model um, at the task of, I think, unscrambling anagrams. I think this is sort of one of the anagram tasks. And uh, so, so the three different colors are the different model sizes. The x-axis here is how many examples of the task the model saw. Uh, no examples whatsoever, um, one example, or it's a log scale, so up to sort of order 20 or 30 uh, examples. Um, and the solid versus dashed lines are whether or not you gave the model instructions. So literally, you tell the model, please unscramble the letters to form a word, and then you give it some number of examples of what's happening. And so you see two things. One is uh, that giving it an explicit instruction in English for what to do significantly improves uh, the performance, at least for, for, for a small number of examples. Um, eventually, with enough examples, the model is kind of figuring it out anyway. Um, and also, the more examples of exactly what you want um, the model sees, uh, the better it performs. So this is in-context learning. It's, uh, uh, it's becoming more and more accurate at, say, solving this, this anagram task, um, uh, which it it's, wasn't trained to do, it hasn't seen before. Um, when it sees more examples and 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 gets a natural language uh, instruction, um, and and just just to sort of emphasize one 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 more time, um, these models are just trained to predict the next word in lots and lots of text that's downloaded from the internet. Um, they are not trained to do any of the tasks that I'm going to be talking about. There was no instruction. There was no explicit training in arithmetic or, or unscrambling or, or any of those things. Um, uh, the data sets, uh, the data set that these models were trained on were the same for all of the models. Um, in all cases, there was enough data that the models are not overfitting essentially at all, even the, even, even the largest models. Um, and, uh, and these tests are also the same for, for all of the models. Um, so here are four tasks, here are four examples of tasks that, that you might be uh, uh, interested in. Um, there are many, many, many more that you can see in sort of the GPD-3 paper, but uh, <clears throat> they show kind of different kinds of behaviors. So in all cases, the model wasn't trained for the task. It's just evaluating it in the same way as on, on the last slide. And so we have arithmetic analogies in, from, from an old version of the SATs, which are tests that Americans take to get into college. Um, there's uh, trivia questions and there's Winograd schemas. So uh, Arithmetic is what it sounds like. There's many, many different arithmetic tasks here. They're all few shot, which means that the model gets to see a bunch of examples of doing arithmetic, but with, of course, different numbers. And then it's it's asked to do arithmetic. Um, so what you see here is the models, uh, uh, the bigger models are better at doing arithmetic. And some of the arithmetic is fairly complicated, like five digit subtraction or something. Um, uh, the other interesting feature to me about this plot is that there's sort of a sudden takeoff. Um, when you go from something like six billion parameters to thirteen, and then and then order two hundred, um, the models sort of suddenly learn how to do arithmetic quite well from previously doing it uh, very poorly and basically sort of rarely getting it getting it right. Um, I think this is very interesting because if there's sort of a sudden change in how well models can do, um, it's very striking and and and, and interesting. Um, and the, on most of the other plots, we see something much more like a steady trend. And on all the other plots, the different colors are whether the model had several examples, like many examples to, to understand the task, a single example, which is one shot, or zero shot means, uh, means they didn't have any examples whatsoever of, of the task. And so for something like trivia, you see very smooth improvement in accuracy uh, at answering trivia questions as a function of, of model size. Um, 
uh, for the SAT analogies, uh, the few shot result for the biggest model is better than the average American high school student taking the SATs that year. So the model gets something like 65% correct. And I think the average uh, uh, college bound high school senior got 58%. So it's already sort of comparable to human performance at, at, at these analogies, even though it wasn't trained to do them. Um, uh, Winograd schemas are a very, very interesting sort of common sense understanding type task. Um, I can say something like a tree fell on my roof and so we got it fixed. And as a human, you know that uh, I was referring to getting the roof fixed, not getting the tree fixed. Um, but a model uh, just based on grammar might not, might not realize that. Um, and so this is sort of showing how the model performs at that kind of common sense understanding of, uh, of, of these tasks. And this is sort of a relatively difficult, somewhat adversarial uh, <clears throat> set, of, set of Winograd schemas. And you, you see there's sort of smooth improvement um, in this task with, uh, with, with model size. Um, and GBD3 is doing fairly well. Um, the kinds of tasks with that this model does worst at are sort of in, are kind of logical inference inference type tasks. It does it does relatively poorly at at understanding questions like like here's three sentences. Does sentence one imply that sentence two has to be true? It's it's relatively bad at that kind of task. Um, so these are these are a bunch of examples of uh, of tasks. Another question that's of great uh, social relevance is sort of can people tell that GPT-3 written text is written by GPT-3? And the answer for short news articles, these are news articles that are maybe like two to three paragraphs, is basically no. Um, so as a function of how big the model is, you test real people, whether they can tell the difference between real and fake news stories, and they, they, they barely can. And so this, I mean, I think this has important implications for uh, uh, the kind of social implications of these models. Uh, yep. So uh, some implications of, of these kinds of results. Um, I think these results suggest that uh, that at least in in many respects there aren't any sort of conceptual barriers preventing us from training even more powerful models. Um, uh, I think these results also suggest some abstractions for sort of thinking about uh, uh, improvements in in neural network performance. Um, uh, at least for me, a lesson is sort of that uh, if you don't see some kind of uh, good scaling behavior as you increase model sizes and compute budgets, then maybe you're facing some kind of bottleneck and you should try, try to avoid that. Um, and I think uh, there's sort of a, and, and as I sort of showed with this uh, mutual information, but I think there are just many other examples, scaling laws uh, in machine learning, I think are really everywhere. And, and again, for me at least, sort of lets me kind of organize uh, what to work on and, and what to be excited about. Um, uh, the, the bottom left table is, is sort of a joke of, if you've read the machine learning literature, there's like a lot of tables that look kind of like this. Um, this is not a real uh, table, but uh, uh, the kind of thing that, that you see. And uh, that kind of table um, might not convince you that our model is actually that much better than, uh, than, than, than all the others. It's sort of unclear, um, but I think that that a plot like sort of the bottom right really is very convincing evidence that LSTMs are, are not performing as well as, as transformers. And it's very useful to see exactly how and in what way, uh, what way they're different. Um, uh, yeah, let's see. So just, there's a question. Um, so yeah, so I mean, there's this question of, is it really the case that every interesting task is a matter of simple curve fitting? Um, uh, I think that's a, 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 a potentially uh, big philosophical question about uh, about what these models are and what they're doing. Um, uh, maybe I'll talk about it at the end. Um, uh, I mean, the reason why we're not using, say, like fully connected networks or RNNs instead of transformers is mostly just this sort of information bottleneck issue with uh, with very long contexts, it's possible that other kinds of model architectures could be used instead. Transformers seem able to model a very, very large number of different kinds of, of distributions um, quite well, um, but, uh, but I don't know, there might be better models. I guess, I mean, the transformer seems complicated for sure when you first see it, but uh, uh, I don't know, compared to what you might've expected if you thought that 
that making progress in AI was like proving the Riemann hypothesis, they're, they're sort of not very complicated at all. They're just some linear algebra and, uh, and, and a like soft max or an exponential function. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so I guess I, I still have a few minutes. Um, so maybe I'll just say two slides about uh, why is this true? So I think as a, as a theoretical physicist, um, uh, uh, I, I certainly am happy to confess that I think sort of a lot of what goes on in, in machine learning is really like we, nature is smarter than us. These models are smarter than us in the sense that the way they behave is sort of smarter than, than what I would have thought of as, as sort of a theorist. But, uh, but, but seeing very, very consistent trends across a lot of different data distributions um, and many orders of magnitude, it's sort of natural to ask, what is the theory for this? Um, so here is a suggestion for a possible theory that explains why uh, the scaling law with, uh, with model size takes the form, uh, takes the form that it does. So uh, 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 basically the idea is that maybe the model, th th this is basically a toy model. It's a very physicist's model. I'm just make up a toy model for what might be happening and see if it sort of works to explain everything that I see. So the toy model is imagine that all this neural network is doing since it's just quote unquote curve fitting is mapping the data in some fairly smart way to a manifold of some dimension, uh, some intrinsic dimension D. And then all it's doing beyond sort of sort of placing the data on this, this, this manifold is chopping the manifold up into smaller and smaller pieces and uh, basically modeling each piece of the manifold with some piecewise linear function, um, something like that. Could even be a piecewise constant function. Um, if the underlying data uh, varies continuously on this this sort of data manifold, then the uh, the uh, the loss the the sort of failure to, of the model to perform is going to be proportional to to the size of the region in which you're sort of modeling the data as just some piecewise uh, continuous continuous function um, rather than say the number of different regions and. That means that if you have a d-dimensional uh, manifold, if you want to shrink the size of these regions by a factor of two, you actually need two to the d times more parameters. And inverting that, what this suggests is that uh, uh, the loss is going to scale like one over the number of parameters to a power, which is a number. It, it turns out to be four if you if you use certain logic, but the four doesn't matter here very much. It's one over the number of parameters to the power of something divided by the dimension of the data manifold. Basically, because what matters is sort of this, uh, this factor of two, but you need two to the d times more parameters. So, uh, uh, so, so sort of that's, that's what you get. And so this is sort of a guess that the exponents that someone pointed out are sort of uh, small numbers, right? There were something like 0.07 are something like uh, one over the dimension of the effective data manifold uh, that, that we're working with. Um, and so with, with, with a student uh, at Hopkins, Yukar Sharma, it's possible to test this with, uh, with, with very small, simple models, and it sort of works. Um, so uh, uh, the blue points are sort of teacher-student setups, which are the most clean possible situation. And uh, Surya mentioned teacher-student setups in his talk. There you can really just control what the data, what the dimension of the data manifold is, and you can, uh, and you can then just you have a teacher model and you train students to try to mimic that teacher model. And you really find that there's sort of a nice correlation between the dimension of the data manifold and, and uh, four over the, the scaling exponent alpha. Um, and then we tried some small other data sets and we sort of got decent results where it seemed like when the exponent is smaller, this, this uh, dimension of the data manifold, which you can sort of measure with some approximation techniques, um, was, uh, were, 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 were linearly correlated. Um, so that was that's that's some work. Um, I'm still working on some uh, fancier and more precise versions of of this kind of idea. But this might be the kind of thing that could explain why there's just this very very simple uh, universal scaling law. And I think the motivation for me as a physicist is that when something occurs all over the place, when sort of everything is the same, the theory that explains it had better be pretty simple and pretty universal. And so that's that's to me what was what was kind of attractive about uh, about this potential explanation. But I think the jury's still out. I, I don't know if this is really, really what's going on, um, but, but maybe it is. Um, so I'll just sort of conclude and, uh, and open it up for questions. Um, uh, it seems like model size, data set size, compute are sort of like, in a way, as a physicist, kind of like the macroscopic thermodynamic variables that govern uh, how, well, how well these models are able to do. Um, 
And uh, the optimized trained loss obeys these predictive scaling laws in terms of these parameters, uh, as long as there's no kind of bottleneck. Um, and I also think that we're sort of still beginning to understand really how these things work. I think there's a lot of promise to understand these systems uh, in kind of the same way and maybe as well as we, we understand, say, condensed matter physics systems, um, or at least, at least some of their kind of macroscopic aspects. So I think there's a lot more to do and, uh, and it's very exciting. So these are some of the papers I talked about in the, the very large number of, uh, of co-authors involved, especially uh, Sam McCandlish and, and Tom Hennigan and my student, uh, Yukarsh Sharma. Um, so uh, that's it. I can I can take many more uh, questions. So Jared, thanks very much. That was uh, that was great. Um, we do indeed have time for more questions. 